Well, it's my privilege to host the eighth meeting of the elusive substrate, prime matter and hylomorphism from ancient Rome to early King China. Uh, it's great to be here with you all. It's an early morning in Boulder, Colorado, but at least the skies are clear and the sun is out and there's snow on the ground. Uh, so a great day to be thinking about metaphysics. Uh, I'm just going to be very minimalistic about sharing this session and just um, get, get things underway quickly by introducing the first speaker, Han Thomas Adriansen, who's an associate professor at the University of Groningen. His talk is on Pomponazzi on matter, quantity, and rarification. Han Thomas, it's all yours. Yeah, thanks. And um, thanks everyone for being here while I'll share my screen. And thanks, Nicola, for uh, organizing. Um, PowerPoint is on its way. So you should now all be able to see my PowerPoint. I hope that's the case. So yeah, I'll get started. So according to Pomponazzi, as he makes clear in several places, one of perhaps the most elusive aspects of prime matter is its relationship to, to quantity, to demands of quantity. Is quantity co-eternal to matter in the sense that matter somehow never loses its quantity? And if so, does that mean that matter eternally has some determinate quantity? As Pomponazzi explains, the a verist answer to these questions would be yes and no. Yes, quantity is co-eternal to matter, and in some sense, matter never loses its quantity, but no, the quantity that is co-eternal to matter is not any determinate quantity. It is an indeterminate quantity, and before matter comes to be in a substantial form, its quantity does not have any determinate limits or any determinate magnitude. Pomponazzi offers an evaluation of this view in two different places. The first being his questions on De Substantia Orbis from 1507. The second being um, his second book of De Nutrizione and Augmentazione, approximately 15 years later. In the first of these works, he discusses several difficulties for the notion of indeterminate dimensions co-eternal to matter. But he concludes that, quote, and the various solutions satisfactory in all parts can be found to these problems. Indeed, in the questionis, he comes across as a defender of averism against what he considers to be the more common view. What I would like to point out in, in this talk is that in the second work, in the Nutrizione ed Augmentazione, we find a rather different evaluation. Indeed, towards the end of that book, um, Pomponazzi comes to the conclusion that indeterminate quantity co-eternal to matter is what he calls a fiction and that we ought, quote, not to listen to the commentator in these matters. So let's see how the later Pomponazzi departs from the earlier treatment in the Questionis. I'll have a look at both of these works, starting with the uh, Questionis of 1507. In question three of the Questionis, Pomponazzi asks, whether quantity is co-eternal to matter. And he begins by presenting some problems for the view that it is. One argument goes as follows. It is obvious that quantity is not co-eternal to matter. After all, we see that in rarefaction, the same matter goes from being under a relatively small quantity to being under a relatively large quantity. And in condensation, it goes from being under a relatively large quantity to being under a relatively small quantity. But if the quantity of matter changes that way, it cannot be co-eternal. So that's the challenge he first poses to quantity co-eternal to matter. Um, OK, so <laughs> we had one challenge. Uh, that is, Pomponazzi raised one challenge. Um, now he's going to argue that this is one of those problems to which um, and a various solution satisfactory in all parts can be found. And the first step towards such a solution, according to Pomponazzi, is to clarify the relationship between quantity and its terms. According to Pomponazzi, indeed, just as prime matter has a potency for all forms and is indifferent to any one form in particular, likewise, quantity, in essence, it has a potency for all terms and is indifferent to any one term in particular. Of itself, and I hope that you can see this quote now, 
of itself, matter is in potency to substantive form, and of itself, matter does not include or exclude any given form. And you need to know that in the same way, the essence of quantity includes no given term, but is in potency to all terms. Given that quantity is indifferent to any one particular term, he goes on to explain, we can think of our affection and condensation as processes in which the quantity of matter remains intact, in which matter re retains the same quantity as the terms of this quantity grow larger or smaller. And he goes on to clarify his position by saying a little bit more about what he means by term here. He distinguishes three possible interpretations of that word. But in the third and most relevant sense of the word, he says, a term just is the extension. So this is a quote, extension, he says, is the third term of quantity. And it is in terms of this kind of term of quantity that Pomponazzi prefers to formulate his account of rarefaction and condensation. Rarefaction and condensation are processes in which the quantity of a portion of matter, perhaps despite appearances, remains intact, but what varies is the extension of that quantity. And one way to spell out this view, he says, is to say that rarefaction and condensation stand to quantity rather like intention and remission stand to quality. Just as the same quality is retained, as some say given color becomes more or less intense, the same quantity is retained as its extension grows larger or smaller. Indeed, in a motion of intentional remission, and here we have a quote in the next slide, the quality we had at the start of the motion is really the same as the one had at the end, but it's changed only with regard to its mode of being. Things are likewise in the case of quantity. When there is a single quantity in essence to which terms come that do not pertain to its essence. And these terms are this or that extension. Thus it is a different mode of extension that alters a quantity and makes it become larger or smaller. And an increase or decrease in quantity is thus brought about by different extension. Further down on the same page, he explains that quantity is of itself indifferent to any one particular extension, but over time, as it were, serves as the subject of different extensions. Indeed, he says, rarefaction and condensation are processes in which what he calls the, quote, aggregate of subject and term does not survive, but the underlying subject does. So in this way, we can say that um, the quantity that is the subject of a certain extension is eternal, but in rarefaction and condensation, this quantity may, quote, undergo corruption with regard to its term, but it does not undergo corruption with regard to the subject of the term. So that's an outline, the account that we get in the questions. The discussion in the Nutrizione ed Augmentazione um, is very detailed. Popanazzi critically evaluates a um, great number of different accounts of rarefaction and condensation. But I think for present purposes, probably the most important lessons from his discussion of rarefaction and condensation in that work are, are the following three. So first, he still maintains that a commitment to quantity co-eternal to matter entails a commitment to some kind of quantity extension distinction. Quantity co-eternal to matter is compatible with rarefaction and condensation only if quantity and extension are in some way distinct and if it is possible for the quantity of matter to remain intact as its extension grows larger or smaller. So that's the first lesson, which is, I think, um, very much in line with what he earlier said in, in the questionis. Second, while a commitment to quantity co-eternal to matter may entail a commitment to a quantity extension distinction, the converse need not be true. A commitment to some kind of quantity extension distinction does not automatically entail a commitment to quantity co-eternal to matter. In fact, in book two of uh, De Nutrizione, Pomponati suggests that the most sophisticated quantity extension distinction that he is aware of, the most sophisticated distinction available in the literature, 
comes from a philosopher who was not at all committed to quantity code and automata. Third lesson is that even in this most sophisticated form, the quantity extension distinction is indefensible. And this then leads him to the conclusion uh, that we um, cannot defend quantity code and automata either, and that we, quote, ought not to listen to the commentator. Now, what I would like to do is, is take a somewhat closer look at how Pomponazzi reaches this conclusion. And I think it would be good to start with what Pomponazzi thinks is the most sophisticated way of distinguishing between quantity and extension, and then see what's wrong with that way of distinguishing according to him. Now, this most sophisticated way of distinguishing between quantity and extension, according to Pomponazzi, can in fact be found in the work of, of Capriolus. Now, clearly in Capriolus, the quantity extension distinction um, is, is detached from any commitment to indeterminate dimensions co to matter. Indeed, Capriolus makes it very clear that quote, there is no accidental intermediary between a substantial form and matter, and that, quote, nothing is more directly in matter than substantial forms, and that quantity inheres in the matter, in, in the composite, and not in matter. And accordingly, quantity is destroyed when the composite it inheres in is destroyed. Even so, Capriolis does think that we can make some kind of distinction between um, indeterminate and determinate quantity. Indeed, according to him, the quantity that's found in the substantial compound is not of itself determined to any given magnitude. We can say, he writes, that the dimension of some subject is indeterminate if it is indifferent to being now larger and now smaller, even though at any given moment, it is under some determinate degree of magnitude or other. Again, in virtue of its essence, numerically the same quantity can sometimes be larger and sometimes smaller. And this can happen through condensation and rarefaction. Now, in making these claims, Capriolis is drawing on a particular understanding of the relationship between quantity and extension. Indeed, he explains that quantity has a twofold task. The first is to divide matter into parts, and the second is to extend these parts. He then goes on to explain that of these two roles of, of quantity, only the first is strictly inseparable from quantity because whenever quantity actually informs a substance, it makes the substance actually divisible. The second, so extending these parts, is a job that can be separa separated from quantity. In fact, it is separated from quantity, according to, to Capriolis, um, supernaturally in, in the Eucharist. In the case of the quantity of Christ's body in the Eucharist, quantity has parts but no extension. Now, of course, this is a supernatural separation, and in the ordinary course of nature, divisibility into parts always comes hand in hand with some extension or other of these parts. At the same time, I think the scenario Capriolis is describing here of quantity separated from any extension is perhaps in line with the account of natural, the natural processes of rarefaction and condensation. According to Capriolis, indeed, um, in rarefaction and condensation, a certain quantity is separated from this or that extension in particular. And seen from this angle, perhaps the Eucharist begins to look rather like a, a limit case where, as a result of a divine intervention, this quantity is not only separated from this or that extension in particular, but from any extension whatsoever, from any um, yeah, extension or spatial distribution of parts. Now, Popinazzi um, offers a very detailed evaluation of, of 
uh, Capriolis's discussion. Uh, but his, his two main charges, I think, are the following. First, he argues that if indeed we have uh, a metaphysics in, including matter, quantity and extension, that is just one, two item too many to account for any of the phenomena we, we may want to account for. Having quantity as well as um, extension is somehow redundant. Secondly, not only is there this problem of redundancy, um, he also thinks it's confused to distinguish between extension and quantity. Indeed, what he will argue is that extension and quantity are just one and the same accident. And accordingly, distinguishing between extension and quantity is like distinguishing between an accident and itself. So I want to have a brief look at uh, these two lines of criticism one by one. So here is the charge of redundancy. I see no necessity whatsoever to posit a quantity over and above extension and matter itself that will be distinct from both. For if little matter is with a large extension, what point is there in imagining an additional quantity in order that to be rarity, extension or divisibility? Certainly that looks like a fiction. So the, the claim he's making is, is, is as follows, I think. In order to account for rarity, extension and divisibility, these are the three phenomena he mentions here, philosophers such as Capriolis uh, introduced three items, matter, quantity and extension. But in order to account for these three phenomena, two items suffice, namely matter and extension. Hence, no necessity whatsoever to posit a quantity over and above extension at matter. As for the first phenomenon, so rarity, matter and extension suffice, he argues, because the moment we have a portion of matter and some given extension, we have a certain degree of rarity. This degree of rarity increases when either the portion of matter remains constant, but the extension increases, or when the extension remains constant, but some matter is taken away. The degree of rarity decreases when either the portion of matter remains constant, but the extension decreases, or when the extension remains constant, but new matter is added to the original portion. Either way, in order to account for rarity, or for an increase or decrease in rarity, all we have a need is matter and extension. No intermediary quantity, as he somehow sometimes calls it. As for the second phenomenon, extension, obviously matter and extension also suffice to account for extension or for parts outside of parts. Here again is Pomponazzi, I do not see the need to posit an intermediate quantity between extension and matter. For once matter and extension are posited, matter is extended, has, parts, has part outside of part. So this quantity that is, as it were, a thing really distinct from extension is useless. And finally, the third phenomenon was divisibility. Matter and extension also suffice to uh, account for divisibility. For the moment we have matter endowed with extension, we have matter that can be divided into two or more units. Um, in virtue of its extension, you're right, a thing is divisible into parts, each of which can be a this something. But this is distinctive of quantity, according to the chapter on quantity in Book 5 of the Metaphysics. So, extension does the work distinctive of quantity, and if that is the case, then he concludes there is no point in having extension as well as quantity, whereas extension is something over and above and distinct from quantity. In the triad, matter, extension and quantity, we simply have one item too many. In fact, and that's transition to, to his second line of criticism, that extension and quantity do the same work should not be surprising because they are in fact one and the same accident. Indeed, he writes, the extension of a quantity is the quantity itself, and again, Extension in quantity is the same as the quantity and not a mode or a mode of being superadded to the quantity. According to Pomponazzi, that extension is identical to and not distinct from quantity it is clear from a number of facts. First of all, it's clear, he argues, from the fact that 
we cannot even conceive of a quantity without thinking of extension. And in making this claim, that we can't conceive of quantity without thinking of extension, um, he, he cites Aristotle's definition of, of quantity as that which is divisible into two or more constituent parts of which each is by nature, is by nature a one to this. And he argues that whenever we conceive of something of this sort, something divisible into two or more constituent parts of which each is by nature a one into this, we inevitably think of something that is temporally or spatially extended. Who could think of a line, uh, who could think of time or of a line without thinking of extension? No one can, according to Pompanazzi. You need extension and quantity cannot be separated even in thought. A little bit later on, um, he continues to argue for the identity of quantity and extension by considering the case of geometrical lines, surfaces and bodies, or solids. According to Aristotle's definition, lines, surfaces and bodies are quantities. They can be divided into two or more constituent units. But according to Euclid, these quantities are defined by their extension in one or two dimensions, one or more dimensions. For according to Euclid, a line just is breathless length, that is, extension in one dimension. A surface just is extension in two dimensions, and a solid just is extension in three dimensions. The case of geometrical lines, surfaces and bodies, according to Pompanazzi, this supports the view that quantities are defined by their extensions and that a quantity and its extension are not somehow distinct. One quantity arrives differs from another by its extension. For a line is extended in length, a surface in breadth, and a body in depth. Indeed, it is more accurate to say that a line is length, extension in length, a surface is breadth, and a body is depth, as is clear from Euclid. And in making this claim, he's, he's not only saying that kinds of quantity are defined by kinds of extension in one, two, or three dimensions, but also that individual quantities are defined by their individual extensions. That is, just as extension in one dimension defines lines in general, this extension in one dimension defines the quantity that is this individual line. And accordingly, he concludes, it is confused to speak of the extension of this quantity as a way in which this quantity happens to be but need not have been. The extension of this quantity is essential to this quantity and cannot change unless this quantity is replaced for another quantity. To drive home this point, he compares the way in which an individual quantity relates to its extension to the way in which an individual living substance relates to its extension. Uh, an individual living substance, such as Socrates, he explains, can change an extension without thereby ceasing to be the individual substance that he is. But an individual quantity cannot change in extension without ceasing to be the individual quantity that it is. Being larger or smaller, he, he concludes, may not make an essential difference to individual living substances, but they do make an essential difference to individual quantities. And this conclusion marks, I think, a break with the earlier discussion in the Quaestiones and first of all, it marks a break with um, his defense of indeterminate quantity co-eternal to matter there. Indeed, Pompanazzi reasons that if quantity is indeed defined by extension, <clears throat> this means that it is impossible for matter to retain the same quantity, yet vary an extension. But we know that matter varies in extension over time. Indeed, that is, according to Pomponazzi, precisely what happens in rarefaction and condensation. Matter comes to be more or less extended. But if it is impossible for matter to retain the same quantity and vary in extension, and if matter varies in extension over time, then apparently matter does not retain the same quantity over time. And that leads him to conclude that there is no quantity that is co-eternal to matter, just there is no substantial form that is co-eternal to matter. 
And that which the commentator says regarding determinate and indeterminate quantity is a fiction. In these matters, again, we must not listen to the commentator. So this is one break, I think, with the earlier discussion. Secondly, and relatedly, if quantity is indeed defined by extension, it's no longer possible to say that in rarefaction and condensation, a single quantity and number comes to be more or less extended, survives a change in, in extension. Indeed, in, in De Nutrizione ed Augmentazione, he, he reasons as follows. If quantity equals extension, and if the subject of rarefaction or condensation takes on a larger or smaller extension every step along the way throughout the process, it must take on a new quantity every step along the way. In the first stage of a process of rarefaction, the subject of rarefaction must lose its initial quantity and receive a somewhat larger one. And in the second stage, it must lose that quantity to receive a yet larger one and so on until the end of the process. Similarly, condensation is a process in which a subject undergoes a series of replacements of larger quantities for smaller ones. In the first stage, the subject loses its initial quantity and receives a somewhat smaller one. In the second stage, it loses that quantity to receive a yet smaller one, and so on until the end of the process. Now, I think it's interesting that Pompanazzi should um, conclude in De Nutrizione that this is the best theory of rarefaction and condensation because in the Questionis, he had mentioned this theory, but had dismissed it as, as pretty miraculous and hard to believe. And in fact, in De Nutrizione, we can still find him struggling with some of the problems that one might raise for this kind of theory. Um, most important of these three, uh, of these are the following three. First of all, one might feel that if rarefaction and, and condensation take place through a series of replacements of form, then the nature somehow acts in vain. Indeed, it, it seems odd, Pompanazzi writes on behalf of, of, of a critic. It, it might seem odd that nature would produce a certain quantity only to destroy it the next moment to replace it for a smaller or larger quantity and to do so a number of times in a row. So that's one worry that he feels the need to address. Um, a worry that, uh, for which he seems to take his cue from Gregory of Rimini. Um, a second worry that he raises is, um, well, if rarefaction and condensation um, involve a succession of numerically distinct forms in the category of quantity, it's not clear that we have a motion of rarefaction and condensation that is genuinely one. So what guarantees the unity of a process of rarefaction and condensation if these processes consist of, of well, successions of series of different, uh, different quantities? Finally, a worry um, he spent some time on is that if rarefaction and condensation involved the, a series of, of losses and replacements of quantity, then everything would be, in, uh, would be in permanent flux. I don't have time now to, to, to say something about all three of these concerns, but maybe just a few words about the, the last concern, because I think in a way, uh, Pompanazzi's way of dealing with this is, is, is most informative about um, his picture of the hylomorphic composition. Um, um, Tomas, let me just mention you're you're just about at the 30 minute mark. You've just got a couple minutes left before it's 30 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll I'll need two, maybe two more minutes, three more minutes. Great. If that's okay. Yeah. So very briefly, what is this third problem? Um, Pompanazzi, so the objection that he raises says that um, we might think, one might think that substantial forms um, inform matter through the mediation of quantity. And if that is so, then every time a quantity is destroyed, substantial form should be destroyed as well. And um, then we would have the following situation. If in rarefaction, a new quantity is generated and the former is corrupted, 
the substantial form would undergo continuous generation and corruption as well, because it inheres in matter through the mediation of quantity. But that is an insane thing to say. And similarly, one might feel that other accidents, qualities, inhere in, um, in, in substances through the mediation of quantity. But if that is so, then every time a quantity is lost, and it is lost a, a number of times in a row in rarefaction, uh, those qualities should, should undergo corruption as well. On this account, rarefying air would also lose its hotness and humidity. But that is a ridiculous thing to say. Well, the answer is, is, is predictable, but I think also informative. So what, what Pomponati does is simply deny that substantial form um, informs matter through the mediation of quantity. It, it, it directly, immediately informs matter. And similarly, for the accidents, they directly um, inhere in a substance. And it's not the case that, say, humidity or hotness inhere in a substance through the mediation of quantity. We must decide, and this is the quote that I'll end with, we must decide that matter alone or the composite of matter and form are the subjects of substantial form and of the accidents. Hence, it is false that quality is founded in quantity. Rather, it's grounded in the composite of matter and form so that when quantity is corrupted, neither the substantial form nor the other accidents are corrupted. And in this way, he, he thinks he can avoid the permanent flux concerns. And in this way, he thinks it is safe to, to follow the advice that he had given earlier, and that is not to listen to the commentator and to accept quantity eternal to matter in, in no way. And with that, I, I think he's, he's reached a conclusion very, very different from the conclusion he had reached 15 years earlier when he wrote that um, to all the problems that one might raise for quantity co-eternal to matter, a quote, a various solution satisfactory in all parts can be found. I thank you very much for your attention. I'll, I'll stop sharing so that I can see you for the Q&A.